so I guess we've learned about the LCS as it's going to fight an air-sea battle uh, against the Chinese using the Russian model. And so what am I going to talk about? <laughs> um, the, thank you very much for uh, having us here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, obviously, my opinions are my own. I'm re not representing the Department of Defense or the Navy or U.S. Cyber Command, although they would be wise to listen to me. Um, <clears throat> So let me just go ahead and start with our pretty pictures here. Uh, you know, Dr. Robert Kaplan recently wrote the book uh, appropriately titled Asia's Cauldron. And the situation today in the Western Pacific and the South China Sea is the potential to be for any number of flashpoints to develop. Uh, my article started with the hypothetical scenario, if you recall. Uh, demographic, economic, and social factors combine to create a sense of instability within China. Pressure begins to build on the Chinese Communist Party to divert attention and galvanize their population. And the first uh, thing that the Chinese do is they decide to challenge the Philippines on their possession of Scarborough Shoal, and they go out and seize it. Now, many people would probably argue that uh, in 2012 that actually happened in, in reality. Uh, the United States, of course, just stood by in my article. That was the hypothetical situation. People today would probably just also argue that the United States uh, went ahead and did not come to the direct defense of its treaty ally, the Philippines. Um, but just like, like I said, in 2012, the U.S. takes a back seat in the dispute, and the islands, in, in effect, become de facto Chinese. Many like I said, would argue this is the case. However, in my hypothetical scenario, after some period of time, this uh, brief uh, victory against the Filipinos doesn't really galvanize the population enough. They're still facing uh, social, demographic, and economic problems. So the Chinese try again to replicate and create a, an even greater sense of nationalism uh, by seizing the Senkaku Islands. Now, unfortunately, in my scenario, the Japanese are not as cooperative as the Filipinos. They actually are uh, fairly capable, and the, China, or the Japanese ride, rush to the defense of the Senkaku Islands, and they declare, uh, they, they demand that the U.S. invoke their mutual defense treaty, and the United States is suddenly finding itself drawn into a conflict with China over an issue that doesn't directly threaten uh, the United States. Now, in the photo above, I have pointed out, uh, let's turning now to, to reality, I have pointed out the rough location of Nanji Island. This is off the coast of the Zhenjiang province. This is only about 186 nautical miles northwest of the Senkakus. Here, China has begun construction of an airfield and 10 helicopter landing pads, according to commercial imagery and is reported by Bill Gertz in the Washington Free Beacon in January. In the lower right, among the disputed Spratly Islands. On Fiery Cross Reef, uh, at the end of last year, commercial imagery showed the construction of an airfield. Now, this may be large enough to actually accommodate China's military transport plane, the Y-20, the, the H-6 bomber, the J-10, and J-11 fighters. In the lower left, I've provided an enlarged image of the Spratlys with the Chinese-claimed islands highlighted, along with Ituaba, which is the Taiwanese claimed island. And notice that is roughly about 200 nautical miles from the Philippines. Now, by combining my hypothetical scenario with real world events, I hope you can begin to appreciate the fragility of the security situation here. Uh, China is deadly serious about its territorial claims and it is building a formidable navy capable of enforcing those claims. I tend to agree with the old saying that Capabilities breed intentions. So these uh, situations bear close watching over the next several months to years. Um, in the article, I argue that China, however, does remain a continental power despite its impressive naval buildup. I still believe this to be true, which is why China could be more dangerous and not less. The potential for miscalculation grows. I've highlighted the major combatants of the PLA Navy and the U.S. 7th Fleet. These numbers are from 2012, and the Chinese have made up a lot of ground since, these, this was, uh, this was, uh, since 2012. 
Since I argue that uh, any American strategy will have to count on our traditional allies, I've also noted in the bottom right corner the Japanese Maritime Defense Force capabilities. And in the upper right corner, I've added a graphic on the ranges of principal Chinese and U.S. weapon systems as of 2013. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and suggest that the PLA Navy has the operational capability of the U.S. Navy, or even the Japanese Navy for that regard. But, as Stalin famously said, uh, qual quantity does have a quality of its own. And are we reaching the point, or at some point, the Chinese just have to be good enough in order to, uh, in their capabilities, to overwhelm their adversaries? We may face a similar situation that Erwin Rommel faced. Uh, he's famously uh, said to, uh, suggested that any one of my Panzer tanks can take out 10 American Sherman tanks. The problem was the Americans always brought 11. Um, the Chinese Navy and Air Force can sustain a great deal of attrition. We may not be so fortunate. Uh, more importantly, none of our allies in the region could challenge the PLA Navy without American assistance. And if you just look at the disparity between the PLA and the Japanese Navy, you can see that there is quite a, disparity, a numerical disparity even just with them. Now, historically, continental powers seek to build navies that can strike at their, navy, at their rivals' vulnerabilities, such as to, traditionally this is uh, trade and sea lines of communication. Uh, examples would include Imperial Germany challenging Great Britain at the turn of the 20th century, or the USSR challenging the United States up into the 1970s. China, however, is doing something a little bit different. Uh, they are building a large navy to expand their region of control, not necessarily challenge our vulnerability. Uh, the U.S. is not as dependent on the sea lines of communications around Asia as the, as the nations in Asia are dependent on those uh, sea lines of communication. And by dominating those Asian slocks, China gave great leverage, more so over the Asians, uh, Asian nations that are there, and many of whom are our treaty allies. Now, before we uh, all start running out to buy our copy of Rosetta Stone and learn to speak Mandarin so we can talk to our new emerging Chinese overlords, um, I contend in a separate piece that was published in the journal Orbis that China does have some problems of its own. Uh, at the end of the day, what we are seeing is actually not a rise of China, but a surge. I, article, I argue in the article that converging demographic, economic, and social factors will place a ceiling on Chinese power, causing her to eventually enter a period of decline. And we actually may already be starting to see some of these signs in their slowing economic growth. Um, their growth weight uh, continues to slow while their population ages and is actually beginning to shrink. Uh, they will continue, to, this, these factors will continue to stress the Communist Party's ability to maintain their, in Chinese terms, their mandate of heaven, their right to rule uh, as people become less and less satisfied with the state of life in China. Therefore, um, America's maritime, become, our ability to project maritime power becomes that much more important. Uh, maritime power, as opposed to other means of projecting power, provides policymakers with something very much more important, and that's time. Uh, the most important of the operational concepts of space and time and force, I argue, is actually time. Uh, space can always be regained. Time can be, uh, or excuse me, space can be regained. Forces can be replaced, but time cannot. Uh, time will be necessary to hopefully contain escalation. Also, I argue that maritime power does not pose a direct threat on the regime's survival. However, if we do need to secure and hold territory, even on the Asian mainland, uh, maritime power will be the only way in which we can project power back into Asia. Maritime power provides flexible response options without necessarily a large footprint, and it can take many forms from traditional carrier battle groups to the small, fast missile boats that some people like to talk about, uh, to theater engagement by both the Navy and the Coast Guard. China is actually what I argue is the greatest strategic threat to the United States in the 21st century, and our maritime power and our capabilities are going to be the 
critical to meeting that challenge. So thank you all very much, and I'll stand by for questions. In the back. Uh, sorry, I'm going to play devil's advocate. So, so I note in the article that uh, the sec uh, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made a formal statement uh, where she did say that the Senkaku Islands, which are under the administrative control of Japan, are included under the Mutual Defense Treaty with Japan. So in real life, you know, it was formally uh, acknowledged by the United States that we would consider that a violation of Japanese political territory and that we would be obligated to respond. Okay. Sure. Uh, so you're getting back to the, you know, the 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 famous uh, what was it, famous PLA admiral that asked, you know, are you willing to trade Taipei for LA? Um, at some point, we're going to have to make that decision. Um, I think that it's more likely, not less likely, that China is going to become more aggressive and not less. And we are going to be backed into that corner because we are a treaty ally. Uh, we actually have mutual defense treaties with more countries in Asia than anywhere else in the world. Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, uh, Thailand. So I can envision any number of scenarios. But the, you know, is it worth the trade? Eventually, yeah, it is. If you want to be the superpower, let me, let me just say that. If we decide we no longer want to be the superpower, then it's not worth the trade. Uh, over there. So every time, because I notice a few of the graphics, they just kind of circle around Taiwan, and whenever everyone discusses the dashed line, they, don't, they just kind of gloss over Taiwan. How does that figure, if at all, into your thinking about the sort of cauldron? Well, you know, interestingly enough, you raised Taiwan. It was, it was the, uh, uh, the Kuomintang, you know, the original Chinese nationalist who created the 11 dash line uh, prior to Mao and the communists uh, actually taking power. And the 11 dash line actually extended uh, down a little bit further. Taiwan and China both have the same territorial claims. And so in a scenario where, let's say, the PLA becomes engaged with uh, the Philippines in, a, in, a, in combat, uh, the United States rushing to defend the Philippines, we could fi very well find Taiwan not necessarily on our side. Um, that Theoretically, Taiwan also <laughs> makes the same territorial claims as uh, the, the uh, communist Chinese. So... Um, I think, though, uh, Taiwan would probably uh, is a lot less likely to invoke those uh, that situation due in large part to the recent Hong Kong uprising. Um, they, they saw very quickly what the Chinese mean when they create special administrative districts and the, Chi the communist Chinese version of, you know, one country, two systems isn't exactly as much of a two system as they were led to believe. So. Um, I think Taiwan is probably starting to rethink uh, its future relationship or uh, any sort of meaningful political integration back into the mainland. Uh, yes. Um, hi. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the assumptions underlying some of the, the scenarios that you talked about. I know they're very specific. Um, so I'm originally from Malaysia, and I've also been really alarmed, of course, Malaysia is a claimant state, so yeah. looking at Chinese behavior the last six, seven years, um, mm -hmm. it definitely is alarming, particularly because, as you mentioned, a lot of the Southeast Asian states, including Malaysia, don't really have the capacity sometimes to even detect what the Chinese are doing yeah. in their waters. Um, 
I did want to ask you about, as I mentioned, the, the key assumption, which is you seem to be suggesting that the Chinese are provoking or being more aggressive because they want to. It, it's something to do with getting support of their population. My impression is looking at what the Chinese are doing and based on their existing behavior, mm-hmm. as well as what some of the other Southeast Asian countries are saying, the, the Chinese behavior and their actions are actually meant to solidify the legality of their claims further down the line. Um, so basically, they're trying to operationalize mm-hmm. the Nine Dash Line, right. and they're trying to basically they do what they did in the East China Sea, which is do what they did in the Paris, right? What, in the South China Sea, right? Yeah, exactly. In identification zone. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you assume that that is what's happening, it wouldn't really make sense for the Chinese to provoke a large-scale confrontation with the United States in the foreseeable future, precisely because, right. as you suggested, the capacities of the surrounding countries to China are mm-hmm. actually very weak. Right. And so Absolutely. bringing Washington into this, this scenario would actually be against Chinese interests. Right. So I'm wondering if you could unpack why the Chinese, why it would be in the Chinese interest to do that. And it doesn't seem to me that domestic support would justify the large scale strategic. Right. And and if you recall, the 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 reason why I suggested they did that is because their economic and social conditions had deteriorated much more than they are today. So my argument is that the Chinese government histo- historically, if you look at Chinese history in the in the past, China becomes very aggressive when they have a very large power disparity. Um, you're right, though. Right now, China to to basically uh, throw this back into military vernacular, China doesn't need to provoke a major corporation because they're winning right now. They're winning in phase zero. They're achieving their territorial goals in phase zero. We're worried about, you know, air sea battle and how it looks in the media. China doesn't care. We're talking about offsets right now, and I've been reading a lot about these offsets that have nothing to do with actually addressing China's critical vulnerabilities. Um, There's a serious problem that we in the United States have to come to grips with. We are so desperate to avoid war with China that we're going to quickly find ourselves as having already lost that war before it even starts. If we really want to find out how are we going to deal with China, we have to figure out whether it's a third offset or what. How do we win and beat China in phase zero and stop worrying about phase one and two? China has no intention of going to phase two in reality, because right now they're winning. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, there was a, uh, a good uh, report that came out recently uh, by uh, Andrew Chubb um, that talked about uh, China's maritime consciousness. And I unfortunately forget the, uh, the name of the report, but it, it looks at somewhat of a static picture of how maritime disputes, maritime claims play among a sampling of uh, Chinese citizens as a you know, priority among their, their concerns. And it's, it's not very high, you know, corruption, uh, environmental concerns play, you know, food safety play a much more concern. So at least currently, and I know Jake was looking at this as a hypothetical scenario, you know, down the line. Um, but currently, you know, it's not really something that, uh, at least looks like it's being played for political gain among, you know, domestically. And, and another thing that Andrew looked at was, um, you know, those who look at government media, whether they are more or less likely to take a, um, you know, confrontational view of the situation that that uh, an armed response or an armed confrontation is the right course of action. And and as a result of those who are looking, you know, receiving a lot of government information saying that we should not go into any sort of armed confrontation, it, it looks at least currently like that's not something that is trying to be provoked, at least, again, currently. And, you know, there's other implications that are you know, kind of interesting. You could argue, OK, this is a static thing. But if then the government tried to provoke it, would that make it uh, something that rose up in the priorities? It's a question. We don't really have the answer to it. But but yes, that's a, an interesting hypothesis.